Okay, welcome everybody to the Sierra Club of Pennsylvania's summer webinar series. My name is Jim Wiley. I'm a volunteer with the uh, Pennsylvania um, chapter of the Sierra Club. I'm, I'm the chapter chair. I'm sure you're all well versed in Zoom etiquette by now. Uh, please keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Uh, you're invited to introduce yourself in the chat box. Or at least tell us, maybe tell us what uh, county you live in. Uh, I expect we'll have a, a good uh, representation across the state tonight. Um, if you have any questions during the presentation, please drop them in the chat. We'll have plenty of time in the second half hour to, to work through these questions. Uh, Tom, our chapter conservation chair, is going to be moderating those questions. Um, and then maybe we can open things up for discussion. Um, Just a little context, in February of this year, uh, the Pennsylvania chapter of the Sierra Club formed eight conservation teams, uh, as shown in the diagram. These teams can be viewed in the context of overall sustainability, climate change, and education about these broader topics. Of course, sustainability rests on the pillars of people, planet, and profit. And in, in Pennsylvania, we have a, um, we have a support system of staff and volunteers to help each of our teams with equity, political outings, and communications assistance, as well as legal assistance, uh, the Clean Energy for All campaign, and a bit of grant funding for worthy causes. All eight of these uh, chapter conservation teams can be found on the Pennsylvania website. You'll find each team's mission statement, priorities for this year, and all kinds of info on these issue areas developed by our volunteer teams with the help of chapter and national staff. Uh, all of our teams have a general mission of looking at their respective issues from a statewide perspective, uh, tracking relevant Pennsylvania policy and legislation and supporting group and local volunteers working in this space. All right, now I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Reebok, who's a volunteer on the water quality uh, conservation team. Bob? Hi, thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to be real brief because I don't have a whole lot I need to say here. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, I'm on the team and we've been working on several things. And uh, Jim asked me to find someone that um, could give a demonstration on this acid mine remediation site in Lebanon County. And I reached out to Trout Unlimited, who maintains it and was very much instrumental and involved in getting the thing installed. And uh, I've been there several times and it's an interesting thing, very beneficial. So I'd like to introduce um, Dennis Kaufman from Trout Unlimited, who's gonna take us through all the details and history of uh, and how it works at that acid mine remediation site. Dennis? Uh, then, well, this evening I will be sharing you information about one of the cold water conservation projects of the Doc Fritchie chapter of Trout Unlimited. And uh, the chapter covers both Lebanon and Dauphin counties of South Central Pennsylvania. The project is an asset mine remediation project, which is located on Roush Creek. It's located in Lebanon County on state game lands 211. This project began uh, 34 years ago but the issue address, it addresses began a long, long time ago. In the first photo, um, you see this project and its influence of a long time ago was the formation of the Appalachian Mountains. In particular, in this area, it's the ridges of Stony and Sharp Mountain and it was the deposit of coal in these regions that we are still addressing after all these years. And the second photo um, is kind of an introduction to Stony Valley. Uh, and in the first photo, you see that <laughs> its name is very fitting. If uh, all those gray areas going up that slope are all rock stones. Uh, and basically that's how it got its name. So I'm gonna ask you to take a ride with me uh, on uh, 3.6 miles 
from the Gold Mine Road and the gate of State Game Lands 211 into Stony Valley. To some, this is known as uh, this whole area between here and uh, almost to the town of Dauphin, located on the Susquehanna River, is known as the St. Anthony's Wilderness. It's one of the larger tracts of land uh, unoccupied and is a, considered a wilderness area and is also um, uh, is recognized as uh, Stony Creek as a, a wild uh, river uh, sited uh, uh, stream. So um, yeah, on this, this ride uh, into this area, uh, a group of TU volunteers members have been making this trip uh, just about every week for 34 years. The only thing that prevents that from happening is snow and ice conditions on the old railroad bed uh, that you see here before you. Uh, however, the volunteers have walked it. Uh, some of us have cross country skied it and snowshoed it in when it was necessary to maintain the wells. Uh, next. The yeah, next photo, please. Um, did, I think we skipped one here, but uh, what I wanted to show you, and, and it's not that important, is, um, and it, yeah, yes, the Roush Gap. This is uh, just the sign that is there. Um, and it, it's a significant area uh, here at Roush Gap because that's also uh, where Roush Creek is located and comes down through the mountain. Uh, it's also uh, the Appalachian Trail uh, comes through this area and comes down through Roush Gap and there's a shelter on the Appalachian Trail uh, fairly close to uh, the Roush Creek. Um, next. I'm looking for the, the sign um, that tells us a little of the history of Roush Gap. Um, here we are. Uh, the, the village of Roush Gap uh, stood here from 1828 to 1910. And if you notice in the sign, the peak population was a thousand people uh, close to where the well was located uh, and up the side of the mountain, there are numerous old foundations. There's a cemetery uh, down uh, the Appalachian Trail off that trail. Um, but uh, there was a, a large area for repair of trains that traveled through this area. Um, that's located, uh, was located uh, next to the, uh, very close to this sign, but on the uh, left-hand side of the uh, rail, old railroad bed. Um, there were villages at Roush Gap and villages at Yellow Springs. And as I said, a up to a thousand people living and working in the valley. There's none today. There's no town, there's no railroad, and there's no mining. Um, there's hikers, there's bikers, and people fishing and hunting, and there's TU volunteers. Um, as I mentioned before, the AT uh, passes through Roush Gap, and I had a sign uh, also kind of stating how many miles it was to, uh, I had a picture of that, um, how many miles it was from a certain point. There we go. Uh, there's the Horseshoe Trail that runs through the area. There's a sign to Yellow Springs and the Roush uh, Gap Shelter is 10.8 miles. That's kind of over in Clark's Valley where, and up in that area where that sign is. Um, there was here at the crossing of Roush Creek in the abandoned railroad bed uh, that some 34 years ago, it was decided to design and build an acid mine 
uh, water remediation project. Um, at first, there were concerns about Stony Creek. Uh, it was a beautiful cold water stream running about 20 miles through a forested wilderness area that was not holding trout, and, or was it reproducing trout, uh, especially in its upper sections. The problem was determined to be a low pH. Uh, and the cause was believed to be acid mine water drainage. The question was, where was it coming from? Uh, there were numerous old abandoned coal mines um, on uh, Stony and Sharp Mountains. Uh, there were testings done on the tributary streams of Stony and it was found that Roush Creek had a pH in the mid fours, uh, which was a major, and, and Roush Creek is a major tributary of, of Stony Creek. Uh, and it's uh, the major one in the upper headwaters of Stony Creek. So if you went down, some of you hiked it back in there, if you go down the length of Roush Creek, you will come to uh, grass, grass Creek, uh, swampy area. Well, you also come to that new beaver dam, uh, but uh, you will come to the very headwaters of Stony. Um, with this, uh, knowing that the uh, question was, well, okay, so it has a low pH, um, what could be done about it? With the help of uh, Penn State, a project in design was developed and uh, Doc Fritchie chapter of TU took that project on. The concept was to divert the water from Roush Creek into a well cistern type structure. And you'll uh, see some pictures of that here in a few minutes. The piped water, uh, then you'd pipe the water flowing into the structure and it would be released near the bottom from three two inch, about two inch holes uh, in the bottom of the well. The design was that the pressure of the water coming out of those holes should be sufficient to roll limestone that had been filled into the structure to grind it into a powder and then put those highly charged uh, that highly charged water with tiny particles would be returned to Roush Creek where it would dissolve and raise the pH. Should uh, I go back to the picture of the box now, Dennis? Yeah, go ahead. That one? Oh, uh, not up there yet. Uh, yeah, there? I, I can talk about these as a picture. This one? That Sorry. One's, yeah. Yeah, that one there, that's a good one. Okay. Um, so I the first thing order. was, um, we have to build a dam. So uh, permission was granted by, um, to build a, a dam on Roush Creek. There were permits that had to be obtained. Uh, believe it or not, this little dam uh, is inspected at a certain time, uh, so many years it has to be inspected. Uh, but the first part was to, to build a dam. And the second uh, was that it needed to have some intake control boxes placed in it. And that you see uh, in the slide just above that black plastic uh, roofing material that is used to, to as a dam at this point. Um, and the next point was to lay some pipe from the dam to the well. Uh, so let's see if we can get a picture of the well up there. Um, uh, so this, this is the well structure. This one is, happens to be the round one. And, uh, and you, it is at the bottom of the stack pipe that you see that angle going down the elbow and then that pipe goes down into the well. Uh, they're at the bottom of that, uh, not quite at the bottom. Uh, there are three water outlet holes. Uh, that's where they're located. 
Why I say not quite at the bottom is when they first put this thing in, they put them real close to the bottom and it blew out when they uh, turned that thing on. I understand and I wasn't there, but it blew out the bottom of that structure. Um, they had to put a steel plate uh, underneath that to, uh, because of all that pressure coming down. It's about a hundred yards, 75 to a hundred yards from this point uh, that you see there uh, up to the dam. Um, so, uh, so you have, we, we had the intakes that are up above, um, and after it is built, you need stone. Uh, so let's see if we can get a picture of our stone supplier. Okay, there is a picture of the wells currently. We have two now. Um, the first one was built 34 years ago. The second was built in the year 2000. Um, and so we need, uh, we need stone and the uh, Pensy Supply has for 34 years uh, donated the stone uh, to this project. And uh, we go through about 40 tons uh, or more of limestone a year, depending on the water uh, uh, stream levels that we have. Uh, right now, I have 40 tons ordered. Um, we're waiting for that to be approved and delivered. Um, and you need haulers. I think I have a picture in there of some of uh, some people that have hauled stone for us. Um, right currently, the gentlemen there uh, for probably 30 years hauled stone for us. Uh, him, a picture of him and his wife. And then uh, currently Sensic uh, uh, excavating has volunteered to haul stone for us. Um, and you need volunteers. Uh, so I'm just going through kind of how this whole thing got going. And we have a photo of some volunteers uh, shoveling stone. Um, there we are, and uh, we're, we're shoveling in this limestone. It's uh, three quarters to one and three quarters inch in diameter. Um, it's not lar real large stone, um, but we'll shovel in about uh, a ton to two tons of stone a week. Um, so uh, I think we have a picture, uh, a couple pictures of people shoveling volunteers uh, that might be there. Uh, winter can sometimes be some problems for us. The stone freezes and we end up um, uh, having to pick it and get it loose to shovel into the wells. Um, I have a, a photo of, um, looking downstream of the wells. I think the old stone arch bridge is in that photo. Yeah, that bridge uh, is no longer there. The, uh, they, they replaced the foundation of that and uh, just have that green steel bridge spanning, uh, currently spanning uh, Roush Creek. Notice the coloration of the, the bottom of the stream um, that is uh, coated with the limestone uh, dust uh, that uh, the well has ground up and put out into the stream. Um, I think I mentioned that in the second uh, well was built in 2000. Um, it it uh, was determined that in high water conditions uh, that the one well was not sufficient to uh, uh, raise the pH. And so uh, they built another well so that uh, in high water conditions that could be uh, maintained a uh, uh, higher level of pH in the stream. And since I'm talking about pH above, I had mentioned that it was four in the mid fours. Um, and uh, below, it'll range between the mid sixes and, um, and uh, seven. So, um, and that is in normal 
water flowing conditions. Currently, we have low water conditions. I just took the pH uh, this uh, past Monday and uh, it was interesting, the uh, rain pH uh, was 6.7, I think, and uh, which, um, and below the well, it, the pH was 6.5. Above the well is 5.37. Um, we get it, we're seeing that we're getting uh, pH in the fives under low water conditions. Um, my, there's some different thoughts on that. Uh, mine is, is that the water table is low. Mine isn't pushing out, the old mine isn't pushing out as much water. Therefore, a higher pH um, is at the wellhead. Um, the other thought is, is that we're not getting a lot of runoff um, because there's a lot of coal over the sides of that mountain and that can also influence um, the, the pH uh, just running over the general mountain surface. The other thing is, is that I think we're seeing uh, maybe as not much uh, acid rain as we had in the past. So we might be seeing some improvement there. Um, so um, I think we have a slide of um, one, of, we're trying to get into the well. I just wanna say that uh, uh, sometimes we have obstructions. <laughs> yeah, there it is. And getting into the project uh, along with uh, winter snow and ice, those are our major problems. Uh, we have permission, we drive in um, each week. Uh, and right now we're going in on Monday nights, uh, six o'clock. Uh, in the winter time, we go in Sunday afternoons at one. We have permission to open up the gate at the gold mine uh, road, uh, the parking lot off of that. Uh, drive in on their old railroad bed, and that permission is granted to us by the Pennsylvania State Game Commission. Um, we are under strict rules that the only thing we can do in there is that we can maintain the well. We cannot carry in fishing equipment. We cannot be hunting. We cannot be hiking and sightseeing and stuff uh, when we ride in in our cars. We want to do those things. We have the same rules as every other citizen you hike or bike in on your own. So uh, just want to let you know that. Um, and we call in every week uh, to say, we're going in at six o'clock. And uh, we call in and say, uh, when we're done in there, we call uh, the South Central office and tell them that we're, that we're out of state game 211. Um, so um, the project, uh, is continuing to work. I, have, I think I have some pictures of us doing some maintenance. It does require maintenance. Um, we've, uh, right here, we're putting in new intake screens. Uh, those were rusting out. Um, we uh, put in new ones uh, this past two years. Um, we have had to dig out the well several uh, times at times uh, to clean them out. Uh, and uh, we've had a few times where uh, Mother Nature decided to do a little damage in there. Uh, Ivan in the year 2004, I, I was not part of it then, but uh, and helping then, but it uh, destroyed uh, made a lot of damage. The water was extremely high uh, in that area and took out some pipe and, and part of the dam had to be replaced. Um, so, um, so I have a couple pictures just to show you the, the well again. Uh, and I think I have some uh, pictures of, yeah, they were doing that maintenance of putting in the new intakes. And um, that's a picture of looking upstream. So that's what it would look like upstream from the dam. And then I have, I think I have a picture of looking downstream in the wells. 
Uh, that's just an overhead shot of the intakes. There's, there's gates inside those uh, and we open up the top and we can control the amount of water uh, uh, coming down through um, or cut it off if we need to do maintenance. Right now, both wells are cut off uh, because we don't have the, uh, enough water pressure to keep both wells running. And, uh, and we want water to continue running downstream. If we would open up our wells, we would, uh, there would be no water going, flowing between the dam and the, uh, uh, the wells itself. So it would be taking all the water out of that. So we don't wanna do that because there are some uh, insect life and stuff in, in that area, and frogs and, and uh, salamanders that we want to, to uh, maintain. Uh, and then I have a few pictures um, of, of the volunteers again. There's an overshot of the well. There's looking downstream. And I think I have one more photo of, um, you see the bridge. Um, notice again, the coloration of the water. We just finished shoveling. And so uh, it really clouds up the water for a short period of time. And then I have one in a group picture, I think standing on the railroad bed. Um, I've been doing this for about 15 years. Uh, and um, I cannot say enough about the volunteers uh, that show up every week. Um, and just their dedication to this project. If we need something done, uh, people have offered uh, equipment and uh, their time, their talents, tools, um, they're, they're there for you. And, uh, and then also uh, the cooperation that we have with the State Game Commission and the donation of stone from Pensy Supply and the hauling of the stone by uh, area contractors. It's just an amazing project. Um, and that's just kept going for this long and it works. Um, we have, it was designated this uh, last summer that this is a uh, reproduction of, of wild trout is happening uh, in Roush Creek. And uh, we see those trout come up in the fall uh, and, and they're not large trout, they're small, small brook trout that are reproducing, they're coming up to the spawning, they stop at the well, they know that the pH isn't any good up above, and, uh, but we see them each, each fall. Uh, right now, it's a tough time for them because the water is so low and it's so hot. Um, that's my presentation, uh, questions if I can help you with some, um, but uh, thank you for all uh, joining in this evening. Uh, this is Tom Al, and I've um, been monitoring chat. I don't see any questions at the moment, um, uh, but we can open up the floor for questions. Uh, let me just uh, make a comment. Um, you know, we in the Sierra Club, thank you very much for your work. I didn't realize how much volunteer work went into maintaining uh, the pH in Roush Creek and Stony Creek. I know all the fishermen who, who frequent Stony Creek are very thankful uh, for your, your work. Um, you see them uh, walking up the, the creek, fly fishermen um, who, uh, who are interested in, cap in taking uh, and releasing uh, native brook trout, as well as the people who hike and, and bike the trails. Um, this is a wonderful project and it's, um, it is one of the uh, most beautiful areas um, in uh, South Central Pennsylvania regions. And um, I uh, welcome, we welcome questions from, from the floor. Jim. Dennis, I'll start. Uh, uh, can you talk about, uh, have you seen 
increased numbers in, in wildlife and in, in fish uh, since, since you've had this uh, treatment? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what was done uh, prior to my getting involved. I do know that uh, early on when I was there, there was some stocking of trout that was going on by a club in Roush Creek. Uh, that ended a number of, well, at least 10, 12 years ago. Uh, but yes, we, we are, are seeing uh, I, more trout uh, coming up into that, that area the last couple of years. Um, so um, I used to, uh, once a year, uh, and I haven't done this for maybe five years, would just go downstream and fly fish uh, with uh, barbless hooks, uh, just to kind of check some different pools, whether we had trout there. I always caught fish. Um, I don't do that anymore. I, I wanna, I, I don't even wanna, I don't encourage people to fish Roush Creek. Fish Stony, uh, it's stocked on up to Cold Spring. Uh, and uh, let, let our wild trout alone up on, on, uh, on Roush. But I know people fish it, they catch fish. Um, as far as numbers, it's, it's really hard to tell. Um, but they're there. There's no question that they're reproducing and they're there. And obviously, uh, this is Bob Rebuck, by the way. I just wondered, do you guys do any um, counts or look for um, the lower feed, uh, food chain, the, uh, the uh, little critters that the trout actually feed on? Do you check for um, how healthy that is or the numbers you may have in the stream? Uh, we, we haven't done that. Uh, we haven't done that. We've had some... Uh, it might have been a couple of years ago, we had a student from Halifax High School come in and, and kick some stones around and, and uh, collect some samples and stuff like that. Um, we were a little surprised that uh, she had, in, she didn't get much above, but I recall she had a, a Helgramite uh, above the well, uh, which uh, I, I just was a little surprised to see that. Great. What's that? What's a, a, a Helgramite is, is a uh, cold water insect. I mean, uh, the um, bug that's in the water, um, I believe it develops into the Dobson fly, if I'm not, um, but anyhow, it, it's, it, uh, it's an indicator of, of good uh, water quality. Oh. Um, but pH isn't always, it, I don't know the insects, I, and I should maybe take a look at this. What insects can, can survive uh, aquatic insects in uh, low pHs? Trout, brown trout and brook trout have been known to survive and do reasonably well in a pH of five. Hmm. Um, and at times we reach that above the, as I mentioned, in low water conditions, we reach that above the well. But when it's that low, those trout are moving, especially this kind of weather, those trout are moving to, uh, cool, deeper water than what, we're, what we have above. I have a question. Um, this is Matt McConnell. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, have you measured the other um, like metals? Do you have iron, uh, aluminum, or any of those manganese? This, this is the fortunate thing that we have. We, I, we have not done that recently, but that was done early on when the project was in design and being recommended. Um, we do not have 
those in any qualities that is uh, detrimental. Uh, if we did um, this project, and if some of you have been to some of the other projects in Pennsylvania and in, in the coal regions, there would need to be holding ponds uh, collecting those heavy metals uh, below uh, or, or even above this, this project. There'd be a combination of, of things that we do not have that problem, fortunately. Um, so we don't have, if you go to some other projects dealing with the issue of mine, acid mine drainage, you have a series of ponds that collect the heavy metals, plus a limestone uh, bed or limestone sand or hoppers um, raising that pH. All right, thank you. Um, so I, a follow-up question um, on the, um, the pulverized limestone, does that present any kind of deleterious uh, impacts on the, the bottom gravel in terms of blocking off uh, benthic habitat for macro invertebrates or, or trout spawning? I would, I would think somewhat. Um, it would, it, it doesn't go downstream very far uh, because it's, it, uh, there's a good bit of uh, turbulation and current uh, close to there. That limestone um, will right below and at the bridge, but I would say not more than 30 yards below the bridge. Uh, there's a bend, there's some good current. Find that most of that has dissolved. Okay. Once in a while, you'll find a small patch of it, you know, down farther, but it's not layered like it is right there, uh, which, it, you know, it's pretty much designed to do. It, it is very, very fine. And the object, I mean, the idea is, is that it's supposed to dissolve. Um, yeah. And, that, and once that dissolves, it, it ra that's what raises the pH. We use a high, uh, uh, what's the word I'm going to use? Uh, it, high quality uh, uh, limestone um, that Pensy supplies for us. High calcium. That's what I, the word I was looking for. High, uh, so I, I think that adds to it. Uh, Judith, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I'm just curious if there is a university or a college near your your work area that students have been or could be involved with this effort. Where we live in central, um, on the sort of middle Susquehanna, Lycoming College and um, both Bucknell and Susquehanna have river research teams. And um, many years ago, a geologist, when he was new at Bucknell, Carl Kirby, went over to Shemokin area and started a, one of these um, acid mine cleanup projects. I don't remember that they had real wells. I know that there's a way that they bring the water over and treat it and it comes back in to the creek. But um, I think Bucknell students may still be involved with doing things like counts of little insects and you know whatever life forms there are in the creek above and below treatment and that kind of thing. And I'm pretty sure they've studied the metals also that this was mentioned earlier. So I'm just curious if, if your area has this kind of resource that students can, and they're young, you know, they can come out and, and help do some of the research, not the heavy work necessarily. We have, on occasion, we've had uh, some people from Penn State uh, Middletown campus uh, contact us and they've come in to visit um, and to see the project. Uh, as far as research, um, I'm not aware that any, any one has done that recently. Other than just students taking some samples, like I said, the student from from uh, Halifax High School was interested in that, and she mm -hmm. did that. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. But that's a good I, idea. I, I, you know, if we're always uh, open to uh, guests and, and people coming to visit, um, you know, we need to, you know, if it's other than our work time, we, we need to get approval from the state uh, game commission to enter. Right. On, on a related note, we have a, a, a an abandoned mine uh, drainage area. It's a passive wetland. And the Lehigh University um, invited invited me to um, coordinate with them. Um, this They call it the Summer Engineering Institute. And for two years running, we had 100 students all over that mine drainage site studying the you know, the macro invertebrate life before and after the, the discharge, you know, how the, the pyrite was oxidizing and how we were settling the, the iron out, all those things that go into um, kind of the environmental engineering aspects. And these kids, they were all high school, you know, um, I guess rising seniors or whatever, high school students. And that was a real treat having that many young people up there at the mine drainage site. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, well, Dennis, it looks as if your group is getting along in age. Um, what is your youngest, about how old is your youngest volunteer? Oh, I would <laughs> say in their 30s, mid 30s, maybe. Oh, good. good, that's uh, good. I couldn't tell. Haven't seen yeah. that young when there for a while but yeah but one of the guys is yeah yeah uh, yeah would that we're aware of that yeah uh, <laughs> well if, if you can manage to involve some students well like matthew said at the high school level they live in the area there that might get them hooked you know like this could be a lifelong passion for them to work on this project mm -hmm. yeah I mean, how many more years do you have in you, Dennis? You know, 20 <laughs> to do shovel limestone. The thought of that, my back hurts already. Just thinking about it. <sighs> well, I, I hope, I, I'm, I hope uh, 20, but pray for me. Uh, <laughs> I'm 74, so we're, you know, we're, uh, and we, we have uh, probably our oldest member. Uh, I mean, it comes every week. Uh, is 80. So yeah, we're, you know, but uh, you know, maybe they'll, maybe their grandchildren will still jump into it. We've talked about scouts, you know, helping at, at times. And every once in a while, you know, some kids will be by and we'll hand them a shovel. Um, yeah. You could do serious outreach then, you know, the scouts I hadn't thought of, but you've got high school students, you've got scouts like Eagle Scout projects. Mm -hmm. Go for it. No, this is a somewhat remote area. You don't actually accidentally stumble on to Route Creek um, um, when you, so you have to intentionally uh, be going there to, to uh, be working on that project. Right from the gate uh, that uh, at the parking lot, it's uh, approximately three and a half miles to get out to the gap. Is that what you have, Dennis? About three yeah. and a half miles. Yeah, it's a little over three. Yeah, three miles, three and a half. I think three point six, something oh. like that. And for us older folks, it's three and a half, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a hike. I, I decided the other year, you know, after I cross country skied it uh, in and shoveled stone and came back out, I wasn't doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> that's that that's the issue with these these remote mine drainage sites that it where you have a um, you know a system that isn't totally passive and it needs to have uh, um, you know either mechanical um, maintenance or like in your case shoveling the the limestone. Um, it's, uh, what happened, a lot of these lines, a lot of these areas, they don't get the volunteer work like you have. So fortunately, um, a posse of people that are dedicated, like they are 
probably most get no support and they just they just operate so if the passive systems are sort of not quite as good as the active systems like i would say yours is sort of like an active system because you have to shovel the limestone in mm -hmm. and in those cases you can get better better um results but you know a lot of these systems are in the middle of nowhere like like we're talking about and the passive systems are uh you know you just kind of hope that that they can continue adding value over time with with minimal input because it's probably no funding either for that maintenance work. Yeah, I I mean we're fortunate that we have the donations that we have from and the cooperation. I mean the I didn't mention this, but uh, why it was located there was because of access. Um, oh, it, it, we were right there at the railroad bed. There was, uh, you know, there was access to the stream. Um, that's not always uh, available either. To, uh, there was a number of years ago, the idea of going higher up uh, and that, uh, and testing was done to get closer to the seep itself because Roush Creek's a beautiful stream upstream of there also. Uh, just an amazing uh, piece of water, but that project fell through. Um, and that was going to be a project of dropping limestone sand by uh, working with uh, the gap in the military to put limestone sand closer to the source and drop it by helicopter. And it uh, still would have required, um, you know, people going up there, volunteers hiking way, way back in and shoveling that sand in, but not as often. It wouldn't have required once a week kind of thing. Um, there is some, pro there's some work up in the upper part of Dolphin County where shovel line limestone sand is dumped along the stream and shoveled into the stream. Um, okay, guys, why don't I uh, go through the wrap up slides and uh, um, then we can we can stay on and chat as long as you want, but then I'll turn the recording off then. Um, is that okay? Uh, so thank you very much, Dennis. This is this has been a, a great presentation and a great discussion. Um, let me uh, just uh, go back to this slide here. Um, thank you all for joining us today and thanks to, to Dennis for, for making this presentation. Here are a couple of important websites. I encourage you to uh, engage with your local Sierra Club group. Find your group at the Get Involved section of the chapter website. Uh, we will be sending out a list of ways you can support public or support uh, uh, water quality um, along with information on how you can get in touch uh, with the, the chapter uh, water quality team. Um, <clears throat> yes, yeah, so we'll be following up with a link to the recording of this section uh, session and any any notes that we put together. Uh, and we'll invite you atten to attend uh, an upcoming water quality team meeting. So be on the lookout for that. Um, so um, thank you all. Um, and I'm going to stop the recording now. Find the right button.